Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, owner of the company Horns of Odin. Before we get into this extra special episode, I do want to just give a quick plug to our Patreon because it's obviously how we keep the lights on. And I think we have probably the most stacked Patreon out there. We do a bonus episode every single week. So after every main show, we do a bonus episode, whether it's a Q&A, our story time episodes, which we now do two of, one with Jonas Lorenzen and one with Claire Moulet. And then we also do a creator show where we get a creator from the Viking craft world who comes on and shows us their craft, they display it. Uh, we filmed our last one last week with Elfuda, um, one of my friends, Tricky, and it was a really great episode. People really enjoyed it. They loved seeing it. And I think that's going to be one for the future that we're going to really get a lot of good feedback on. So if you do want to check those out, please just go over to Patreon forward slash Nordic Mythology Podcast. It starts from £3 a month, which is 10 a day. It's effectively buying me a coffee. Now, I do want to get into to this show because I'm really excited about it. It is our 200th episode. and I'm joined by my lovely... Co- I'm going to start calling you co-host, Margaret, even if it's not every week. Uh, so Margaret Havga is with with me, and we're also joined by Caroline Larrington. Uh, Caroline, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's a great honour to be here on the 200th show. I'm really excited. I know. it's. I mean, I can't believe we've got through 200s and have not been cancelled for something that I probably may have said wrong at some point or someone Jonas Lorenzen probably says wrong because he says something we have to edit out every time he ever comes on um but we've made it to 200 which I think I think is no mean feat yeah I think we've we've done I mean wow 200 episodes that's like it's a big number yourself that's really something yeah I know I'm surprised people aren't sick of hearing my my little northern accent by now. When when me and Mateus started, if somebody said we'd get to two hundred, I would have been, I would have been surprised. Uh, obviously, you know, we started this as a a little side project. I think it was bef- just before COVID. I don't think it was in COVID. It was a direct response to my company using people of coloured models in our clothing because uh, we. I have a like a Viking lifestyle business, Caroline. Uh, we use people of color in the models, and we got a bunch of like unpleasant comments aimed towards the models. Uh, so that was the whole reason the podcast started because me and Mateus spoke about kind of how we could help arm people with the right information. So that was the the whole yeah. reason we started this, and we somehow now got to two hundred episodes, and I've I've been lucky enough to speak to so many amazing people from the scholarly world popular culture world the the list is pretty incredible um and i now get to tick off another person from my my bucket list um i think my my top 10 is going down very very quickly at this rate um caroline do you want to let people know who you are what you do what people might know you for Sure, yeah. So I'm Caroline Larrington, and I have just retired from my job teaching medieval English at the University of Oxford. I have always, ever since I was a student, in fact, before I was a student, I went to work in Norway for a summer when I was 18, and that was what really kindled my interest in Scandinavia. I'd already got to know something about Norse mythology from the kind of books you read when you're a kid. But then when I discovered I could study Norse myth as an undergraduate, that was what really kindled my interest and it's never gone away. Mm -hmm. So I research into Old Norse mythology in particular, but also Old Norse literature more generally. Um, I also do work on medieval women and stories about King Arthur. And most recently, for about the last 15 years or so, I've been interested in medievalism. That is the way in which medieval literature and culture turns up in the contemporary world. And my latest book is The Old Norse Myths That Shape the Way We Think, which is something I wrote over lockdown. Mm -hmm. And that looks at the ways in which Old Norse myths, do they actually shape the way we think? That might be a bit debatable. But nevertheless, they are alive and well in our culture in all kinds of places. And that was a fascinating thing to research. But you might also know me from my translation of the Poetic Edda, which I started on 
oh, 30 years or more ago now. But um, I produced the first edition and then after a while I thought I would like to redo it in some ways. And so I produced the second edition with a few more poems bunged in to encourage people to buy the second edition as well as the first. And that came out in 2014. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe the poetic Edda, my account of the Norse myths that I wrote in 2017 for Thames and Hudson, mm -hmm. and then the old Norse myths that shape the way we think, that are really the my main contributions, if you like, to old Norse myth in the real world outside the academy. But I could also mention a couple of books I've written on Game of Thrones, Winter is Coming and All Men Must Die, which um, were really the, the beginning of my interest in medievalism. And I'm a, still a complete Game of Thrones fan. I Yeah, I love it. Despite I have to be honest, the final season. I, that, yeah, we, we <laughs> I let, mean, that's a necessary disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm one of these, I think you have to just take with a pinch of salt, but I think they gave us so many hours of amazing TV that I'm just going to allow it and let it let it go. Just just pretend it was good. That's yeah, yeah. That's, that's the way. I have to be honest. Um, as a as a Brit, the intrusive Brit inside me, as soon as you said King Arthur, was like, oh, let's just sort all this Norse stuff and let's talk about King Arthur. I would love to hear about that. <laughs> I was like, oh, we yeah, could always me. weave it in. It's, we, it's not, yeah, not a yeah. big leap. <laughs> no, I'm sure we we could. Um, your your book on the the Norse myths is actually on my bedside table right now. I've been reading it. The I'm not the fastest reader, I have to admit. Um, and I've been going through it again this this week. And I was like, I'm going to finish it before the weekend. And then as soon as I start, I, I get about 10 pages in and fall asleep. <laughs> it's so rivetingly interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I just realized that comes across really bad, which I didn't mean. Uh, now, I was I was telling you before I was, I'm renovating the house. So that's the reason I, I get into bed and I'm I'm absolutely shattered. It's not that the book is bad. Uh, <laughs> it's it's just that I'm, re, I'm, I think I'm one of these visual, like a visual learner. All my teachers at school taught me better through storytelling. I was never one for books. And I think that's why I've had so much benefit from this podcast because I get to sit in this position and just have a lovely conversation with somebody. And I just remember it so much better than trying to read a page. As soon as I pick a book and, and I just look at the page, I just, I'll catch myself reading a paragraph going, oh yeah, what what have I just read? Especially when there's names well, in especially there. Especially late at night, yeah. Yeah. And, there's a, and obviously there's a lot of names that I don't quite, get or I've got to really think about pronunciating. So it takes me maybe 30 seconds just trying to figure out a character from the name because I'm not that... I'm used to kind of hearing it, I guess, on the podcast as well. Of course. So there'll be names I'll figure out what they are and I'll be like, oh, oh, I know that one. I do I do know that. I just don't really know how it's written down. So it is It is definitely helpful to see it. Um, but, you know... I'll get there. I'll finish. I have read it before, by the way, just well, to that's, that's just, just once to, maybe enough. Yeah. Just to cover my back. I, I haven't just fallen asleep on the first read. <laughs> oh, I feel so terrible. It's what a good start we got off to. <laughs> um, okay. So let's, let's get into the poetic. I think we should start with because your translation into English is the one that is recommended to our listeners time and time again. You know, if I had a pound for every time we'd had, because the question does come up, we'll have a different person in the audience who say, what book should I read? Because it is a minefield on what text to get, where to get your information from. And the and the guests always, especially the scholarly guests, always recommend your translation of the, the poetic edit as the one to go to. Like, this is the one, get this one, it's better than the rest. So you're doing something right. Well, when I first started working on the translation back in the early 90s, I was really astonished by the fact that it was really hard to get hold of a decent translation of the Edda that didn't sound like it had been composed in the 15th century or something. What you had, even in the 20th century, even a couple of really distinguished translators like W.H. Jordan and Paul Taylor would use all kinds of archaic language and they would use a lot of these and thous. They would talk about swains and maidens and use all kinds of words which made the poetic edda sound outdated. 
Mm-hmm. And what I wanted to do was to to find a language that would allow you to explain what was happening in the myths, but also not to to make it sound a little bit modern. Yeah, to like and to make the, it more accessible. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of my students had said to me that if they picked up some of the old editions, like Lee Hollander's edition, which is out of copyright and is fairly freely available on the internet, they would need a translation for the translation because they just couldn't figure out what some of these these words meant. And there is quite a temptation. You would find it with William Morris in the 19th century to go, oh, okay, this word in Old Norse, well, that had a cognate, a related word in medieval English. So let, let's use the medieval English word, even though nobody uses it in modern English anymore. Mm-hmm. So, for example, the word um, rauder in Old Norse, which means advice, and which you find in, in German still, as in the Rathaus, the place where people get together the town hall to take counsel with each other. And it's still the word for advice in in Scandinavian languages. We had it in medieval English as read, R-E-D-E. And it's the word that turns up in the name of Ethelred the Unready, the unfortunate king. He wasn't not ready for things. He didn't have the good advice. Um, And Morris and Magnusson, in their 19th century translation, used this word read every time they wanted to talk about advice. And you can see exactly how people have never come across that word before, just go, what even is this? And they would also mess around with the word order as well and have the, the, the main part of the sentence coming after the verb or before the verb. And so it'd be really hard to figure out who was doing what to whom very often in the in the old translations. So what I aimed to do was to try to find a language that was modern and accessible and idiomatic, but mm-hmm. also to not misrepresent what I thought was on the page. When I came to do the second edition, that was great because that gave me the opportunity to think again about some of the choices that I've made. And whereas with the first edition, I was really thinking about accuracy, I guess, and choosing maybe the first word that turned up in a dictionary or the most obvious word. But in the second edition, I thought more about how it sounded if you were reading it out rather than reading it on the page. And that meant I put in more alliteration and I listened to the rhythm a bit more and I I shortened some of the lines. I don't think I changed the meaning particularly, but some word choices I made in the first edition, I thought, "Mm, actually, I'm not sure I like that anymore. And I switched that around. But the second edition, I think, does have more of a kind of swing to it. If you read it out loud, you get a sense of, not of something that sounds exactly like Old Norse, of course, but something that's got some of that rhythm and some of that alliteration has survived. Mm-hmm. I guess that has to be difficult because obviously you're translating something that is meant to be like a poetic medium, putting it into English, but trying to keep that, but obviously, but obviously it's completely different in some aspects. Yeah, um, we're lucky in a way with... Eddic poetry, that it's composed in the same kind of basic pattern that we have across the Germanic languages. So it's the same pattern that you find in Old High German, for example, and it's what you find in Old English. And it depends on stresses in each particular line and on alliteration, and also in some places whether the syllables are longer or shorter. But Eddic poetry is relatively easy to translate in contrast to Scaldic poetry, which is the other main kind of Old Norse poetry, which is incredibly complicated. Mm. I don't know if you've had podcasts on Scaldic poetry, but there you have to think about alliteration, full rhyme, half rhyme. You have these really complicated kennings with five or six different constituents in them. So Eddic poetry is easy in contrast. And Mm -hmm. where you do run into problems with the poetic Edda is where you have words that scholars called uh, hapax legomena, words which only turn up once. 
Okay. And you look at it and you think, well, I can't look that up in the dictionary because dictionary definitions of words are made up of looking at different examples and figuring out in context what they must mean. But you've just got this one word in mm. this particular context. And sometimes you think, okay, that's, that must be an obscure word for a spear. But sometimes you look at it and you think, nope, I have no idea what this is. Yeah. And there you have to ask yourself, is this because this is just a word that nobody captured anywhere else? Or did the scribe get it wrong when they were copying the manuscript in the 1270s? Did somebody shout, hey, do you want a cup of tea or something? They took their eye off the, the page and they forgot what they were writing. The mm -hmm. manuscript of the Poetic Edda, the main one, is pretty well copied. But every now and again, you can see that um, they've looked at or either looked at the text they're copying from or have kind of forgotten it if they were writing it down from oral memory and have just made a mess of something or missed out a line or something like that. I, I wonder how many hours scholars have spent wasted on just trying to figure out errors this they, they could never solve it's just a mistake but you obviously you take the time to try and research and figure out if you can work out what this word is but you really have no chance because it is just a mistake it's an error yeah if it is just a mistake but then sometimes it might be for example your runic inscriptions are always turning up in Scandinavia. Objects are being dug up out of bogs with with words carved on them in runes. And sometimes you get a sense of, oh, hey, that's a word that we also find in the in the Poetic Edda. Mm -hmm. um, so now we might think that this word might mean knife or something like that. That's a made up example. I can't think of a, an obvious one, but you can get some new evidence to help you figure out what words mean when mm -hmm. you've got an obscure word, but you can't count on it. No. So, yeah, I think scholars do their best with the words that they can't figure out. And sometimes you can see where somebody has just skipped a line because the line that they were writing looked like one that they had somewhere else in their mm. exemplar and their eye just skipped down to a different place. Mm -hmm. So I'm everybody's human and particularly the scribe of the, uh, the, codex, uh, the, the Codex Regius, the Poetic Edda main manuscript. I mean, that must be a headache when you're working with it, but at the same time, it to me kind of springs to mind that it almost makes the manuscript a bit more alive because you're like, oh, there was an individual here who was working on this and, and messed up or misremembered something. Like this is this is actually kind of a, a snapshot of a living person in, you know, the 1200s who, who tried their best and didn't always work out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And who knows what they had in front of them. And we do assume that they had some written versions of some of the poems which have not survived. But sometimes maybe they were just poems they knew by heart. And it's, as, as Dan was saying earlier, what you take in by listening works rather differently from what you take in by reading. So mm -hmm. it's a, it, we would love to know more about what resources they had to create that manuscript. Mm -hmm. I, I think probably everybody listening to this has probably had an argument based on a text that they've received because they couldn't get the context behind it. Whereas when you're in face-to-face -face conversation, you can kind of understand what something means. You can read body language and you get a whole picture. But when you just words, sometimes that's, that's lost or it's really hard to portray and get across. Yeah, and we can see in the Edda manuscript that what the the person we might call the compiler who wrote down the the uh, the text in the twelve seventies seems to have thought was we have all of this poetry, but we also have bits which don't necessarily make sense. So every now and again, we might need to put in a little prose bit, a little prose introduction, for example, to explain the circumstances. And one um, good example here is the poem Grimnismal, the Saints of Grimnir, which is the third poem in the Poetic Edda. And if you just had the poetry, it would be a bit mysterious. A man called Grimnir 
has suddenly started to speak and he delivers this long monologue. And then at the end, after he's given you all this really arcane mythological wisdom, uh, a figure called Agnar rushes up to help him away from the fire that he's complaining about. He's sitting too, next to, too close to the fire. And the speaker Grimnip says, Agnar, you will be king hereafter. Okay, so we want to know how it is that Grimnir has got himself in this situation where the fire is coming too close to him. We want to know who Grimnir is. How does he know all of this stuff? Well, he's the god Odin. Well, what's the god Odin doing being tormented in a human hall by this king whose patron he used to be? And so somebody thought, I will write an explanation as to how this situation came about, why Odin has come to check up on how his his protege is doing as a king, because his wife, Odin's wife, Frigg, has told him that Gera, that the king, is really stingy and tortures his guests when he thinks too many of them have come to the hall and he doesn't give them any food. And then Frigg has loaded the dice against Odin, who's gone to investigate this, by sending a messenger saying a really powerful wizard is coming to your hall. Best thing to do is to sit in between two fires and give him no meat or drink. So Gera that gets caught out by this, of course, and when the man at whom no dog will bark, there's another sign of wizardry comes to his hall. He does what Frigg told Potter him to is. do. It is, yeah, yeah. Um, it's very sneaky. And... Um, and Odin, admittedly, if you read the introduction, seems to have started it by provoking Frigg in the first place. But you can see there how the compiler of the Poetic Edda thought maybe it's 250 years since Iceland converted to Christianity. Not everybody knows the context of these poems. It needs a bit more explanation. And we're very grateful to him or her for doing that because otherwise the poem would be kind of strange to understand without that context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a, I don't know if this is the right question for you, but I'm going to go with it anyway. We'll find out. Um, so I heard in, in one of your earlier interviews, because I, I listened to a bunch today, and to put into to context for people, please just correct me if I get this this wrong. The, the Poetic Edda was compiled in... 1270, am I right? That's about right, yes, for the main manuscript of the the Eddic poems. Now, we've got some of the poems are preserved in other manuscripts. Mm -hmm. So the Poetic Edda isn't really a thing, as it were, not a, a material okay. thing. You've got this manuscript with 29 poems, and then editors have traditionally added in three or four other poems. Sometimes they add in different ones. Sometimes they chuck some out again. In the 19th century, they had a different view of what Eddic poetry was. And they would bring in some poems, which we now think of as 18th century imitations. And other poems have been rediscovered. Mm. So you've got this main manuscript from 1270, the Codex Regius, the King's Manuscript, as it's called. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this little kind of... Um, a number of other poems that have have been absorbed into the the idea of what the poetic edda is, poems like Gabaldas Droma, the dreams of Balder, or Rigsthula, the the list of Rig, or um, Hindulio, the poem of Hindla, and Grottasunger as well, the the song of Grotti. Those are the four main poems which are counted as being part of the poetic edda, even though they're not in that key manuscript. So they're in other other manuscripts from approximately the same time period, like from when they were written down, or do we know that? Or well, approximately ish. Okay, in yeah. Way. <laughs> um, so um, let me think. Baldur's Dromer is in a, a similarly thirteenth century manuscript. Um, Grottesunger is in one of the manuscripts of Snorri's Edda. And that is a bit later, I think. Um, Hindulio, there's a flat air, but 15th century. So there, there may be 100 or 200 years later, but people have fairly confidently identified them as B 
being the same kind of thing and yeah. probably of the same general age though like when the, the, the tradition first kind of. composed yeah is yeah. another matter mm -hmm. so am but, i am i oh, gone no i was no. just i was just thinking um ever since uh i heard you were coming on as a guest and i got really excited about it um kind of on a general level like how how do you even how do you even go about translating something like the kind of multifaceted collection of that is now known as the poetic edda considering that there are already translations out there and the fact that the the language both in which they were originally spoken but also that they were written down and isn't really spoken anymore like how do you as as a translator even go about doing that well, um, the tradition in, in the scholarly world these days is to pronounce Old Norse as if it were modern Icelandic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, except when I was young, the people in Cambridge, for their own peculiar reasons, liked to try to use reconstructed Old Norse pronunciation. But that also raised questions. Do you use reconstructed pronunciation from the 9th century or from the 12th century or from the 15th century? Um, you know, which is the right one? Because you have to think about how sounds have changed at different times. So you do have a sense of, of how the sound system of the language relates across the board. When you, sure. can, you can, even though nobody speaks Old Norse anymore, they speak Icelandic, so you do have a sense of, of how words would be pronounced in Icelandic, at least. And then one of the things that I was, particularly with the second edition of the Poetic Edda, what I didn't want to do was to go and look at other people's translations into English, because I thought I would end up borrowing their phrases without even necessarily meaning to. Um, so in order to get a sense of the language as Germanic, I tried not to use too many Latinate words or yeah. words that were derived from French. And what was really helpful there was reading translations into German. Yeah. Which was, uh, which would remind me of less, maybe slightly more obscure English words and would remind me to say maybe fair instead of beautiful. I mean, beautiful actually is is a word you can't not use. But there would be um, some words that it would be quite possible to avoid, even though the obvious one is French derived or Latin derived by thinking, ah, oh, but what would what do we find in German versions? And then that would often help with the alliteration as well. Mm -hmm. So do you get access to the do the original document still exist? Is it legible? And do you get access to that or at least scannings of that? So, Because I imagine you have to go back to the original source if you want to do this without any influence from other people's translations. Well, the original sort, well... The question of original is kind of complicated, isn't it? Because you know, what is the original of any one Eddic poem? What we've got is this manuscript, which is pretty hard to read. Mm. And they certainly won't let you rock up and say, can I get it out of the, the, the safe where it's kept in Reykjavik and kind of yeah, have a leap through it. Mm -hmm. um, there are... When I was younger, there were pretty good quality photographs already of it. And now that we have digital technology, you can blow things up on screen and say, OK, is that an R or is that a T there? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? What's How do we know this poem is stopped and this new poem has started? And so what people have tended not to do is you start with an edition. Somebody, yeah. we've got many, many editions of the Poetic Edda. And over the years, people have written down what they think the manuscript says. But as you're editing, you're always slightly improving it. The manuscript's got a lot of abbreviations in it. So first of all, you've got to expand the abbreviations. 
then you've got to decide whether a word that seems to be slightly oddly spelt is some weird word you've never heard of before, or you do correct it back to the word that makes sense in the context. Mm -hmm. Then you have to figure out whether somebody skipped something out or skipped over something and whether you should put something back in again. And my own supervisor, Ursula Dronka, who did some editions of the Poetic Edda, some of the poems of the Poetic Edda, back in the 60s, she was a great one for saying, you know what, I think this verse in this poem probably ought to be in that poem. So she would just pick up this verse and go, right, I'm putting it in here. And she put it in italic so you knew that she had moved it around. But she would also fill in lines saying, they must have had something here because it doesn't alliterate. So I'm going to make up a line which has got oh, wow. a lot of alliteration in it. Yeah. Um, that was the kind of thing you could sort of get away with just about in the 60s. But now um, in in scholarly edition making, you put down what's in the manuscript. Mm. Then you have to make some decisions about whether you make it look more readable. Yeah. And um, change, swap out some letters so that they're more recognisable. Mm -hmm. And decisions like that but what we don't do is start remaking poems by going you know i think these verses would really fit nicely in here <laughs> so even the editions that you use you you have to look quite carefully about what the principles are that the editors have used so that's where you start is with a particular edition mm -hmm. and okay. say right this is the one that i'm translating Mm -hmm. And that's quite helpful because somebody who's looking at your translation will go, okay, well, what does the original say? And you want to go and look at a particular edition and you find that it stands at 34 of this poem that you should be looking at. But if you looked at somebody else's edition, it might be stands at 33 because they have decided that the stanzas, though they're normally quite regularly regular, sometimes they're irregular, and then you can't quite decide where this stanza ends and this one begins. So you get different kinds of numbering across different editions and so on. So you have to pick an edition and stick with it, basically. It sounds way too complicated for my little, <laughs> my little brain. It's hurting even just you talking about it, let alone having to actually try and do it. I mean, it it also sounds like there is um, such a great benefit when there are so many uh, additions that that when you have picked one and that you're sticking with it, if you do have genuine questions that you just can't figure out, you then have the ability to compare and contrast to other yeah, editions you can. to be like, okay, so what what's it here or what like I'm I'm really trying to figure out exactly how this all fits together, but if I compare it to all of these ones, maybe I'll. I'll have a better idea of what's going on. Yeah, so for example, at the the university in Frankfurt for the last nearly 30 years, they've been working on a commentary to the Poetic Edda. And there they go through every single stanza of all of the poems and more or less line by line, they give a translation, but they say this editor in 1864 thought this word meant that, whereas this one thought it meant that. And this one in 1932 thought it meant that. Wow. And then what's quite helpful, is, then they say, but actually the person in 1867 must be wrong because that word has no modern equivalent in any of the Scandinavian languages. Much more likely is what the guy in 1932 suggests because there's a Norwegian dialect word that means the same thing. Right. And so what they do quite helpfully at the end of, of each of these discussions is to say, well, okay, this is our translation and we've decided that this word means this. So you can still disagree with them, but you can sure. see how they've arrived at that particular decision. And mm -hmm. this is now eight volumes, really, really huge volumes, um, which weren't available when I first did my translation of the Edda because they hadn't started on the project. But by the time I was re redoing the second edition, I was able to get hold of a lot of the 
I had all of the published editions of the the commentary, and the ones which were still being published, a friend lent me the the unpublished files so I could have a look and see what oh, wow. she thought about them. That's amazing. I, I had no idea that even existed. That's from the University of Frankfurt, was that what you said? Yeah, it's all in German. So Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh fine. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. But, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, if you find looking at German translations helpful as I did, um it it did assist with my thinking about what kind of choices to make in the for the different words. Mm -hmm. If so if you if you have to base on an edition do you have i guess you have to rely that that edition that you're looking at has been done accurately or is the chance yeah because obviously you have to have a really sound starting point and to put it into context with what margaret does um so margaret at the minute is working with the Osterberg textiles and i guess oh, you're right. you're almost the the first person to be working with them in their raw state and trying to reproduce like reconstruct them by by re tra tracing over them doesn't sound quite right well i'm the i'm the first i'm the first person who's who's been lucky enough to be able to digitally illustrate them mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. which wasn't a part of my project originally but it turned i had a really hard time figuring out kind of like uh kind of like the same way you were saying with with figuring out what each word means it's kind of the same thing but just visually like what where are these threads going like what am i looking at and then mm. comparing it to earlier illustrations, but being like this, like I get why this person drew this way in 1916, but it doesn't really make sense to me when I'm looking at it now. So I've had the opportunity to to sit and like basically with an iPad kind of try to sketch them anew. Um, yeah, and then you can magnify now in the way that you couldn't before, can't you? You can see where yeah. that thread goes. I can literally like zoom in right yeah it's kind um, of stitch by stitch yeah yeah so exactly I, yeah um but it's it's really i don't know where you, where, where you were going with that dan but uh <laughs> i just jumped into <laughs> no no um what i was saying is obviously i feel like for you you get to really work with the original piece so you're not obviously there are other drawings but you're not too hindered by other people's work whereas if you're having to really mainly base off another edition you have to make sure that's really sound footing if you're going forward from there so i i guess how do you do that make sure that the starting point is right yeah well it's it's the kind of academic consensus in a way that um the edition that i've always used was one that was it was a german edition and it was one that was the the fourth edition so they'd already had the opportunity to change various things and revise okay. them. And everybody in the scholarly community said at that point, that's the one to use. And although a big new Icelandic edition has come out since then, um, this Necklenkun 4, as we call it, is probably still the best. Okay. So pretty much how yours is going to be for everybody moving forward. Ooh, well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> People are coming out with new translations all the time. But yours seems to. When did you do the original? Because it seems to have stood up for quite a while now. The original came out in ninety six, and then the second one was twenty fourteen. So that's I'm quick, quick maths. Uh, over 28 twenty years. Uh, twenty eight years. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh 28 years i i mean i don't know if that's a long time in the when it comes to this kind of thing but it feels like yeah it's, it's done pretty well i have to say and i don't want to disrespect other people's translations because other people you know like jackson crawford for example mm. is aiming to do something different with his translation he's not necessarily thinking about how useful it would be to use in a university class that you can look at my translation, look at the original, and go, okay, she's translated that word with that. Okay. Which is is an important thing for using it in the academic context. So it's a bit different from making a translation that you might just pick up and never look at the original and just enjoy it mm -hmm. on its own terms. Though I mean, happily, I think people can do that as well with mine. Well, that's it. How do you find that 
balance of it being legible to somebody like me so i can because i can pick it up i've read it and i understand it and it makes sense but also it can then be used in an academic setting for people not like me they're a little bit they can do quick oh, maths like margaret quite a lot of it's got to do with the amount of explanation you're allowed to put in by the publisher um publishers don't like a load of notes and okay. they don't particularly don't like them on the page so they want them all stuck at the back and they don't want lots and lots of them so they've got to be pretty much at the point and you have to write an introduction that explains what needs to be explained but also doesn't kind of close down the opportunity for people to make their own decisions about what a poem means or what it's pointing to. Mm -hmm. So um, one of my friends, when I first did it, said, yeah, what well, in the introduction, why don't you just tell us what the damn things mean? And I said, no, no, that's not what I'm in the business of doing. Um, maybe I'm going to tell you what it says, but what it mm -hmm. means is a whole different question. That's true. Um, okay, so I just looked to the time. We're, yeah, we're gonna, we we're, got hung up on the end there, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So I was going to ask if, I, I think we, we we stick on the editor because I've got a few more things that I really want to know and I'm, I'm sure Margaret does and then we can do the Q&A after. And if you would like to maybe come back in the future, uh, we could then look at the modern side of things and how myth is into... The, the modern culture because otherwise if we try to tackle that now it's going to be very rushed and sure yeah let's sign me up for the 300th yes the 300th i mean um, it has to happen now <laughs> it does yeah because I, I think that would be that I, I that's a really fun topic to me and i wouldn't want to rush it and just kind of gloss over it in 10 minutes and go blah, blah. so i'd rather we just do another like 10 15 minutes on this then we can give people a good a good amount of chance to ask you some questions and it's not kind of all cramped um sure so i think yeah i think that would be fun so the I, I have two questions left that that i have about the edda um and then margaret can ask you any that she has as well um the first one am i right in understanding that the king's manuscript just disappeared until the 1700s um so it it, it was written or compiled in 1270 but then it wasn't brought to light until the 1700s. Is that right? Yeah, that's um, it, it was in the 1600s, but 1600s. the 17th century. Yeah, you're okay. right. So we know it was written in 1270-ish by the the style of the the writing in the manuscript, yeah. um, and we guess it must have been in circulation because people made some copies of it. But none that were particularly old have survived. But okay. people copied individual poems into some different manuscripts. But what happened to it after that is really obscure. It's been argued that the great early modern poet, Hattelgrima Pieterson, had it in his possession at one point. And the arguments for that are a, a bit obscure, but we know that it turned up somewhere in the north of Iceland and Bishop Brynjolfur Sveinsson got hold of it and put it with a bunch of other manuscripts that he was taking to the King of Denmark as a gift because this was in, in the early period of Danish interest in old Scandinavian heritage. And the Danes knew that a lot of stuff had been preserved in Iceland. And so they were on the lookout because they had um, the King's Library. They had a lot of scholars who were interested in studying this stuff. They didn't quite have the University of Copenhagen yet, but it was kind of embryonic, if you like. And so you had a wave of officials who were going backwards and forwards between Iceland and Denmark, which was, of course, the colonial power, who was the ruler of Iceland. And if you wanted to make the king and his scholars happy, you got an armload of manuscripts and took them off and gave them to him. And he would look at some of them and put them in his personal library. And the Codex Regis of the Poetic Edda is one of those manuscripts, which was clearly treasured. And what also seems to have happened was that 
a bit from the middle went missing. So one of the poems, Sigurd Rivermal, Belay of Sigurd Riva, is missing the ending. And we think it was a whole gathering. So that was eight pages went missing. And if you think about how a book is made, you have four leaves, mm -hmm. basically. So you have a piece of parchment like this and you put another one inside it and then you've yeah. got eight different surfaces but this arrangement is pretty detachable so somebody must have pulled that out at some point maybe it's been hypothesized that um that was a part which has a lot of information about Sigurd the dragon slayer in it and somebody just wanted to have that stuff whatever it was also, there's a load of stuff about wisdom as well, human wisdom, kind of wise ways to live your life by. Maybe somebody wanted that. So that went missing. And we have some of the end of that poem in paper manuscripts, but the missing poems that were in that missing um, gathering are still missing. And so we would love to know what was in there. Books have been written about what must have been missing because we have a prose saga about Sigurd the Dragon Slayer, which seems to, to call upon that lost material, but it's written in prose and not in poetry. It cites just a, a couple of verses. Mm -hmm. And there's a book which has never been translated into English, sadly, but it's called Kornung's Book. Um, the, the Book of the King, and it's by the Icelandic crime writer Arnalda Indriðason that uh, many people will have read his detective stories about the detective Erlender. And uh, Arnalda wrote a detective story involving Nazis, very much kind of like Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, and rediscovering this lost gathering wow. and what happened to it. It's a terrific read, but unfortunately, nobody ever translated it into English. Oh, what a shame! I, I hope those missing pieces are in somebody's grandma's loft, just sat, and then one day they'll they'll come out and they'll be rediscovered. Because, but I, but that, I think that's all, almost as fascinating the idea that somebody's taken this out because, like, oh. I, I want this bit, um, so I'm going mm. to keep keep this little bit. That's almost kind of as cool as the book itself. This story that goes with it of like as much as we want the pages, it's like it's got this little bit of things. Like it's very human, isn't it? Just taking those pages and being like, oh, this is I want this little bit now. This is yeah, that could be really useful. I'll take it and give it to my friend to copy it, and I'll bring it back. Oh no, he <laughs> lost it. It's it's those kind of accidents that can really shape the history of manuscripts. The dog ate it. You know that got used. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody def definitely. But used am I that. correct in in remembering that is this a manuscript that's been done on on vellum? So that just yeah. like technically it it is possible that it could potentially have been preserved somewhere. Like whereas if it was paper, it the chance would be maybe a little bit less. <sighs> yeah. Um and in fact, in Arnalda's novel, it's been buried in somebody's grave. And um, so you get a bit of grave digging at the beginning of it and finding this, this I mean, wrapped in cloth that it's excavated from the clutches of this skeleton. But yeah, um, the kind of thing that seems to have happened to so many Icelandic manuscripts in those periods before the collectors really started gathering them up and bringing them back to Denmark for preservation was that they were used to stuff people's socks or the, the vellum would make a nice stiffening for your shoes. Um, we've got one manuscript of uh, a very important um, bit of the story of Tristan that somebody made as a pattern for a bodice. So you've got a kind of neckline cut into it. And one of the most famous examples of this, in fact, a Norwegian translation rather than an Icelandic one of some poems. And it's the the mitre, the hat that a bishop wears, <laughs> has got this unique vellum inside it as a kind of siphoner. And somebody discovered those fragments only, I guess, about 50 years or so ago. 
So you can kind of see why Icelanders who cared about their literary heritage thought it was better to take them to Denmark, even if they were sort of despoiling their their own culture, because they knew that poor as Icelanders were in the 17th century, they would just pick up that stuff that nobody could read and, and use it to fill the drafts in their broken windows and that kind of thing. It's, I guess, but it's also needs must at the time. It was probably just an, a normal item that you would use to fix a problem, just like we would today. You don't always know what it's going to be worth or the value to something in a thousand years, 800 years time. Yeah, nobody can read it. It's all mm -hmm. in this difficult to read script. But then at the same time, people are still copying sagas like crazy right yeah. up into the early 20th century, you're actually handwriting stuff out because for a long time, the only printing press in Iceland was in the possession of the church and they would only print religious material with it. So if you wanted a really exciting saga, you had to go and borrow your neighbor's handwritten copy mm -hmm. and either read it out to your household or copy it out yourself. So mm -hmm. it's a very interesting kind of parallel to print culture going on for a long time in Iceland. Wonderful. Okay, so I I added an extra question that I have. I'm I'm really sorry. So let's do like a quick fire. I don't know if you have any, Margaret, but I have I have two that I, I would have, like I have to, one to get. Okay, so let's we'll do them quite quickly so then we don't overrun too much and people get chance. Because I know you said your dinner is on the stove, so you need to be out of here by six thirty. Um, so the first one um was just kind of to piggyback on on the the. the, the talk we just had and that was that i guess this was if this was compiled in 1270 how christianized do you think the, the original manuscript is because i think particularly modern day everybody looks at snorri's edda and is like oh well he was a christian living in a christian country so it's clearly got a lot of christian influence in there but then i think a lot of um i guess Entry level people into this world, kind of where I was a few years ago, then look at the poetic editor who don't know when it was written, just automatically go, Well, that is the, for a better word, pagan Bible, Norse pagan Bible. Uh, so that is the one that has had no Christian influence to it. But obviously, it was written after. It was written by Morris. Christians because only Christians yeah. know how to write in the Roman script. But what you don't see is much interference uh, in the way that that Snorri obviously makes decisions okay. about um, what he's going to put in and what he's going to leave out. Snorri doesn't want to tell the story of Odin hanging on the world tree on Yggdrasil. Mm -hmm. We assume he knew it. Um, there's some good mm -hmm. evidence to suggest he does, but he doesn't want that story because it looks too much like the crucifixion. Um, so... Probably what, what we can say about that period in 1270 was that people were really interested in this stuff as antiquarians. It's, okay. They wanted to know about the old tales that their ancestors were interested in, but they weren't coming to it from the point of view of still believing in Odin or still believing in Thor or worshipping them. Or, or the, yes, they were still giving their kids names, based on the Norse gods. But at that point, there's no real belief. Okay. So it's kind of harmless in a way to mm. tell those tales and read them out and go, oh, did you ever hear this story? Rather than thinking that this has got something to do with real life ritual and, and ceremony. Mm -hmm. Okay, my, my last one before I hand you over to Margaret is how do you tackle words particularly the one that comes to mind is like Jotun um mm. where everyone associates it with giant but obviously giant in to, to most people in English means a large creature whereas obviously we don't we know that it probably wasn't that it's more akin to like a different maybe race or type of person or being um yeah how do you how do you go with that and try and keep that separate and make sure it comes across well, it's a difficult one, and in the translation, I use giant because that's the accepted term for translating. Yeah. And um, you try and put a note into the introduction saying giants aren't necessarily 
really, really big. Those, you know, frost giants, some of them clearly are. Um, but in scholarly writing, more often than not now, people just use the term yurton rather than giant and put in a little note saying, we don't really know what kind of people these are. And so we don't want to translate them in a way that automatically makes people think that they're sort of huge and lumbering. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit similar to the question of fairies, because everybody thinks fairies are these tiny little creatures like Victorian flower fairies. Or And this is partly Shakespeare's fault for having tiny fairies in um, Midsummer Night's Dream. But medieval fairies, about the same size as everybody else, and when they turn up, you're talking to them face to face, and they're pretty scary as well. Not these kind of twee creatures fluttering around with, they don't even necessarily have wings. So these kinds of supernatural categories, you've got to be quite careful about how you're going to use them. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, Margaret, feel free to ask your, your one, and then we'll let the the viewers ask. Yeah, I was just wondering, since you've, you've worked so much for this collection now, and especially since you've done a translation of it twice, are there any, um, I mean, I guess picking one would maybe be difficult, but do you have maybe a couple that you are, especially of the poems that you're like, especially a fan of, or like that you hold kind of dear to your heart? Do you have any favorites out of the poems that you're kind of like, oh, this one, or either like you had a fun time translating it, or that it's just the story itself, it's just like, oh, this is really good. Um, I guess my favourite poem is always going to be Verla Spout, the very first poem in the mm -hmm. collection, this Sirius's Prophecy. Um, and it's partly because we've got, in fact, unusually three different versions of it. We've got one in the Codex Regis manuscript, we've got another one in the um, Hoax Book manuscript, and the verses which Snorri wrote down in his Edda as well. So that's my favourite because I just love the sweep of it from the the time before there was nothing, when gap bar ginunga, when there was just nothing at all, and then going through to the end and that kind of sequence of events. Does this one cause this one? Was Ragnarok always inevitable? And what is it like when it comes? And the answer is it's terrible. But you also have the hope of the earth rising again a second time out of the sea and finding those lost golden gaming pieces in the grass. So that's always still my favourite, I think. Um, but I'm also very fond of the the first poem of Helgi Hunding's Barney, Helgi the Slayer of Hunding, because for my money, that in about stanza 27, I think, has the best description of what it would be like being on a Viking ship when Helgi and his men are sailing out beyond the sight of land. They're going off to, to start a battle with someone. And you have this wonderful evocation of the sound of the sea, the splash of the oars and the kind of clatter of the shields on the side of the boat as the the, the ship glides along because it's got a good wind, but they're rowing as well and it's really going at speed. Um, and that's that's a, a poem that I have a lot of time for. That's so cool, yeah. Especially since it's so like, kind of, almost like it's it's an experience. It's kind of detailing what it would be like to be there. Yeah, it really does give you that sense of the kind of soundscape of being on the ship. Oh, amazing! Well, that was my question, Dan. So wonderful. Um, okay, let's let's wrap this up so we can let people ask you some questions i don't know why i ever thought we were going to get through two topics in <laughs> an hour you're ambitious uh, <laughs> I, I i am but i i should have known better by now um okay so caroline do you want to sh just shout out your your books again the names of them so people can pick them up i think i we we stock at least two of them at horns of odin so people can head over there and grab one if they would like uh you know a little Smooth. plug <laughs> okay, well, um, the, you can get the Poetic Edda from All Good Bookshops. It's published by Oxford World's Classics. Thames and Hudson have the Norse myths and the Norse myths that shape the way we think. Um, Bloomsbury published the two books on Game of Thrones, Winter is Coming and All Men Must Die. 
I've also got uh, a book on Morgan Le Fay, pretty old one now, called King Arthur's Enchantresses, and a a book which has been very popular called The Land of the Green Man, which is about um, British folk tales and their relationship to place. So just Google Caroline Larrington. There's only one of me, and you'll probably wow. find something that you can give your aunt for Christmas or birthday. <laughs> How Amazing. hardworking are you? <laughs> I just like writing. Good. Wow. Good. Wonderful. Um, Margaret, do you want to let people know where they can find you? Well, yeah, same as, as the past couple of times. It's based, Instagram is basically where I'm at now before I have a bibliography that I can shout out like Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Archeobags on Instagram with a K. Perfect. <laughs> and then it's Daniel and Scott Farrand one for me. Um, you get to see pictures of me doing my house up and mainly just Rocco. It, there's a lot of pictures of, of my dog on there. Um, <laughs> and obviously the business horns of Odin and then just the podcast is Nordic Mythology podcast on everything and don't forget the youtube channel you get to watch all the episodes that seems to be getting more and more popular on that side of things and a lot of the time guests bring little slideshows terry gunnell did a lovely little slideshow for us and our very own margaret did a nice little slideshow for us as well and showed us your your drawings so yeah go and check those out but i'll yeah, do a slideshow up. next time wonderful Yay! that Here would be go. awesome yeah, uh, I don't want to wait till 300, so I'm going to try and put it, let's go for 250 maybe. Okay, we <laughs> can do that.